Welcome everyone, I'm Ashanti Edwards, the Director for Professional Development at the American Society for Cell Biology. We are pleased to offer online with LSC as a part of the ASEB Professional Development Webinar Series. Today, our facilitator, Dr. Emily Scott, will be introducing our featured author for this installment of Online with LSE. Emily and Rob, you can turn on your screen now. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to today's session of Online with LSE. Um, just as a reminder, the goal of these webinars is to be a virtual journal club. And so uh, you can get kind of a behind the, behind the scenes insights into different education research studies that are happening. And so um, to do that, you can make use of the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit questions throughout the webinar as we go. And I will synthesize those questions and then present them to our speaker. So um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rob Erdman. And he is the Director of Campus Learning Data and Technology at the University of Minnesota Rochester. And he is going to be talking to us about his work uh, using genomics as a lens for thinking about and analyzing classroom observation data. So welcome, Rob. Thanks, Emily. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here today and uh, to, to share a bit about uh, how we're thinking about uh, these uh, ideas. Um, the, the work we're talking about today is uh, based on the paper that was published in CB Life Sciences Education in spring 2019, Classroom is Genome, using the tools of genomics and bioinformatics to illuminate classroom observation data. And so um, uh, I'm speaking today, but uh, I also wanna um, acknowledge um, Dr. Marilyn Staines, uh, who is my partner in this work. Um, Marilyn is, um, uh, was my postdoc mentor and um, is just an absolutely fantastic person. So if you ever have the chance to work with her, take it. Uh, you won't regret it. Um, and um, another just quick note is that uh, just a couple of months after um, this was published, it was, all of the contact information was already out of date. Both of us have left the University of Nebraska. Um, so um, Marilyn is now at the University of Virginia um, and myself, uh, as introduced, I'm at UMR. Uh, so um, that's uh, just kind of a little bit of background about the, the paper and us. And uh, with that, we'll kind of dive in. So. If we're thinking about just an individual classroom behavior, um, say a student asking a question, uh, I, I, I can say with a lot of confidence that any of you watching today would be able to um, identify the fact that that is happening if you saw it in a classroom. Uh, that's simple enough and we can all recognize these behaviors, but what makes education re research so fun and challenging at the same time is that uh, it, it's never that simple. Uh, we're, we're, we may have behaviors that in isolation uh, are easy to think about or uh, parse out, but um, they're always in the context of a thousand other things happening, things that follow, things that proceed, um, the ordering matters, the overlap between things matters. Um, you know, if we're thinking about a student asking a question, um, that question could take on a variety of different types. Um, the uh, instructor's uh, answer um, could be a very different. Uh, they could throw a, a question back at the student or they could just give a direct response. There's a million different things that are interacting and um, that can make uh, studying kind of the nuts and bolts of what's happening in the classroom tough at times. And one of the biggest things that um, we have in our toolkit to try to deal with this complexity is classroom observation protocols. So these are tools that enable an observer, either someone who's live in, in the classroom or someone watching a video recording of the classroom after the fact to characterize what's happening, um, to see and like I said on the first slide, to say, oh, there's a student question. Let me flag that. Um, but in a very like regimented uh, and orderly way. And so 
on this slide, I'm just showing um, uh, one of the um, supplemental tables from the paper, uh, but just the very top. Um, these are just four classroom observation protocols out of quite a number. Um, and all of these uh, have a real-time component. So as people are observing behaviors in the classroom by students or by uh, instructors, um, they get associated with the time in which they happen in the classroom. Um, but each of them is looking at different things. Um, COPUS, the Classroom Observation Protocol for Undergraduate STEM, has 25 different things that coders are looking for as they watch a video or as they observe a classroom, um, covering both students and faculty. Um, but something like Flanders Interaction Analysis, lower on uh, the slide, is looking very specifically at verbal interactions and nothing else. So they can be either very specialized or very general. And so there is one, um, one thing that um, Marilyn and I uh, found troubling about classroom observation protocols is that we were collecting all of this really rich data. You know, this is happening here. This is happening then five minutes later. Um, and, you know, you get these patterns of, you know, you can imagine a, a binary on off for particular behaviors. And you'd see where they happened in the classroom and get this recording. Um, and all of, all of these different patterns uh, show um, three blocks of on and three blocks of off. And so a lot of the time, we end up lumping them into this average, the summary statistic of, oh, you spend 50% of your class time doing X behavior, uh, or students are doing X half the time. Um, but you can imagine each of these four patterns being very different in terms of what it means for student learning and engagement. So if you imagine a scenario in which an instructor asks uh, questions of students interspersed uh, every couple minutes in a classroom, that might have a very different feel as a student to one where all of the questions are asked at the very end. Um, and so our, one of our like guiding, uh, like driving questions um, that kind of inspired a lot of this was, can we actually um, avoid relying so heavily on summary statistics? Um, not that they're inherently bad, we can get really great insights from them, but can we think of ways to better utilize all of the really fine grained data that we're so pa painstakingly um, annotating on all of these videos or as we're sitting in these classrooms? And so that was kind of the, one of the driving um, things that uh, uh, started us down this path. And so what um, the, the approach we ended up using to address this was to think about, um, you know, how, um, how might we actually be able to analyze that type of information uh, in its like um, kind of very granular form. And uh, I am a plant genomicist by training. So uh, I thought about bioinformatics tools. Um, and there were, I, I realized the more I thought about it, that there was a lot of uh, similarities actually between classroom observation data and a genome. Uh, so uh, we can talk a lot more about this uh, as we go through today. Um, but just as like a 10,000 foot view um, of like how this kind of shook out, um, when you think about uh, a genome, you're often thinking about multiple different types of information at the same time. You know, you could be thinking about uh, mRNA transcripts, you can think of a, be thinking about chromatin marks, you can be thinking about where small RNAs are um, being expressed, um, DNA methylation, and we can look at that all at the same time at a given position within a genome. It's the same thing in a classroom. Lots of things can be happening at the same time. 
Um, and we want to be able to utilize that overlap because it's meaningful information. Um, but all of this is against a defined scaffold. For the classroom, it's easy, it's time. Um, in genomics, we're thinking about, you know, what position along this long string of DNA bases we're talking about, but anything can be lined up against that scaffold. Um, and then we can think about how, you know, if you're doing uh, an analysis uh, of a genome, you have for most eukaryotic organisms, you have many chromosomes that you're thinking about. And um, so you need to be able to utilize independent but parallel analysis of what's going on in chromosome one, chromosome two. You know, the end of chromosome one isn't necessarily right next to the beginning of chromosome two. Um, and it's the same with these analyses. You know, you're, you might have a videotape of a classroom of the same instructor, but it actually could be two months later that you're analyzing the next class. So it's not fair to say that you just, you know, stopped the first class and then immediately launch into the second. Um, so it's kind of flexible with how we define our uh, analysis constraints. Um, and then lastly, just the point that patterns and directionality are kind of central to how we think about that. Um, if you're thinking about uh, biological problems, it really matters if a chunk of DNA is right in front of or behind um, a gene. So in terms of how that's expressed, it's the same thing with uh, if you were to watch a video of a classroom kind of in reverse where the instructor answered the question before the student asked it, it would seem nonsensical. Um, so, you know, we, um, we have to take directionality and the orientation of where things are into account uh, when we're anal analyzing things, just like any type of genomic analysis. So, and at the end of the day, um, what we can do is what we've uh, termed classroom as ge genome analysis, uh, which is just basically taking our classroom observation data, putting it into a form that uh, bioinformatics tools can recognize and work on, and then using those tools to start looking for patterns um, within our classroom observation data in a, in a very scalable way. Um, one of the really, the most exciting parts about this uh, philosophy or approach is the fact that we can, you know, do a thousand um, uh, classrooms in our analysis pipeline just as easy as we were to do a single one. Um, so we can really scale this up and start to look for patterns within larger data sets. Say you want to study how your entire department is uh, doing things. Um, you can lump everybody in at the same time but still like maintain separation if you want to do subsets of that bigger pool. So it's very flexible. Um, so with that, um, that's kind of our, just our super quick introductory piece. Um, and we'll use that as a, a starting point for um, launching questions and discussion. Um, and we can kind of take uh, you as the attendees, uh, your cues as to, what you want to hear more about and what we can delve deeper into. Great. Thanks, Rob, for giving us that introduction. And uh, yeah, go ahead and start submitting your questions. Um, while you're doing that, uh, I guess maybe just to get things rolling. Um, so you had talked about how um, you saw this need where it seemed like um, when you were using some kinds of um, observation protocols, you were concerned about losing data when when things are being lumped into summary kind of statistics and stuff. And so is that something that you just kind of, um, I don't know, uh, methodologically were, um, saw was happening and were curious to find a solution or were you involved in like your own kinds of classroom analyses and you were finding it problematic not to have that finer scale of uh, detail? Or I'm just thinking like more into like how, how you, um, devised your genome scheme? Yeah, no, it's a um, great question. Um, so I think that um, I, um, some, some in the audience may be familiar with the idea of uh, Anscombe's Quartet, 
uh, it's this um, uh, uh, semi-famous uh, um, set of four data sets that have the exact same summary statistics, the same like uh, regression line, the same uh, slope of that line, the same median overall on the X and the Y axis. Um, you know, so if you were to just plot like a line of these four data sets, they all look identical, but one's a parabola, one's like an, a vertical line with one outlier out, out to the side, one's like the perfect line that it's being traced by the regression line. You'd look at these and you'd be like, these are not the same at all. Um, and so, um, uh, one, one big, um, uh, inspiration was just that is that, um, you know, we and others would report, um, these percentages of, of say folks spending on average 75% of their class time lecturing, for instance, um, and you know you'd have all of these other things, and you wouldn't really know is that like uh, one unbroken chunk are people interspersing it with other things, um, and I think there are a number of papers that have really started calling for using that information and and lots of additional information to start seeing like we're implementing active learning techniques. But, and we know that they work, um, but how do we get at the mechanics of like exactly how did work, they work best? Um, and we thought that a big part of addressing questions like that would be to actually be able to get into the, uh, the nitty gritty of like, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, a particular behavior, when is it happening? How long is it happening? Um, what surrounds it? You know, how do you lead up to your questions? Um, how do you follow up with your questions? Um, and so one of the, you know, that was just an unmet need in, in our eyes is like, how do we actually analyze that type of information and enable that digger, uh, that deeper digging of uh, like taking all of this information that we already have? You know, if you've taken the time to code something for, use uh, Copus or Flanders interaction analysis to say where everything is happening. You've already done the work, yeah. you know, <laughs> you should take advantage of it. Um, so um, that was, you know, that was a really big thing. And then I'd say the other thing is that both, uh, uh, both Marilyn and I are fascinated with patterns. Um, and we, we felt like education research was really ripe for more investigation of specific patterns of instruction. And we, we really wanted to be able to like enable that for ourselves. It's like, th these are things we're curious about in a variety of questions. Um, and the tools really aren't there to do it, so. Okay. Um, so we have one question um, where this person is asking how the large scale classroom observation data are collected. So I don't know if you want to just briefly like give an example of how a protocol is used to collect those data. Yeah, and I think um, so I, that, I can imagine that question coming from two angles. So I'll answer them both, both of like, you know, what, what does it mean to like get the data set um, like in the first place uh, and then actually like um, translating that into uh, like actual like using the observation protocol. Um, sometimes that happens at the same time if you've got people live, but a lot of these studies um, people go in and, and will videotape uh, classes and get the audio of them and you'll, you'll but depending on the study have potentially uh, hundreds of different class periods and information about what that class, um, you know, what the topic, the subject of the class is and who the instructor is and what institution it's at. And so there have been some really wonderful studies uh, that have looked at dozens of institutions with people from each of them kind of submitting uh, videos into a central like 
uh, analysis bank, uh, and which at which point um, coders uh, who are trained in whatever observation protocol uh, you're interested in, um, say Copus or Flanders, go through and watch the video and mark down exactly what's happening at each point and get this big spreadsheet of zeros and ones. Uh, this is happening or this is happening or this is not happening um, linked to the time period along that uh, video. Um, and uh, it's uh, usually a lot easier to do that uh, on video than live. Um, uh, as someone who's used classroom observation protocols, uh, it's um, if you're an expert, you can do pretty good live, but it's a lot to be trying to keep track of in the moment. So it's really nice to be able to like rewind and say, oh yeah, I think I missed something there and be able to kind of uh, have a record of it um, if you're not sure in the moment whether something should be uh, coded one way or another. Um, and so, yeah, like um, you, you can, kind of then build this very rich and large data set of lots of different classrooms that have been annotated with uh, all of the supporting information, um, which is then what we can kind of feed into downstream analyses. Great. Um, so another uh, little bit maybe methodological question. Um, so someone else was wondering, so if you're trying to make connections between like a class period as a unit as an, of analysis, um, and then connecting that with um, what's happening throughout a course and maybe different conceptual threads that are coming throughout a course. And so um, just maybe some practical examples of how you are making those kinds of connections or using the tools to make those kinds of connections. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, as, I'm, as I'm hearing it, like, yeah, it's, um, it's one thing to have, uh, you know, a very detailed spotlight on a very particular, like, 60 minutes of instruction. Um, and it's another entirely to think about, well, how does that fit within a broader ecosystem, uh, the course as a whole? Um, and so, um, you know, the... The short answer is it really depends. You know, <laughs> uh, it depends on the type of connections that you're trying to make, um, and and so um, you know, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. One is which is do is it something that you're trying to connect to something that's changing over the course of your course? Uh, for instance, maybe you teach one unit in a very different way than another based on the content that's being taught and how, um, how you best see fit to actually communicate that. Uh, in which case, probably the best route is to just actually make sure that you have recordings that actually cover the, the, the change that you're trying to see, you know, things that are happening within that first unit and in the second unit. Then you can actually have that one, yeah, that, uh, a versus B comparison with the backside, the, the background knowledge of, I want to look at A versus B because I use group work in B and I don't use any in, in, in unit A. Um, yeah. Now it gets a little trickier if, if the idea is I have like classroom observations in my, um, across my course, but I'm trying to connect it to um, some type of overarching um, theme or concept that I want to study, in which case um, you, you will have that knowledge in, in the back of your mind as you're analyzing the data, um, but it may only really come into play if you're trying to compare it to something else. Um, so um, that, um, that's something that isn't necessarily kind of baked into the philosophy per se. Um, but it's something that if, if you have things in mind about it, uh, can be linked to how you set up your analysis in the first place. Um, how you're actually going about answering questions within your observation data that you have. Okay. Um, so um, another question, it, 
was um, asking if you had any um, examples that you've encountered in your experience or uh, maybe could brainstorm about where um, sequence was really important and made a difference for answering a particular research question. Um, I think this goes, uh, um, you had talked about this a little bit with your, um, you know, the way you visualize the data. Uh, and so this person was just thinking about that again. Um, so I don't know if you just want to touch on that again um, when you're talking about how, when, when sequence of events could be really important. Yeah, that's, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and, and I'll actually, um, I'll take a couple of, um, I'll skip to a couple of slides that um, are pulling from uh, figures in the paper. Um, so, um, and so this is, this is a, one example of that in, in play. Uh, is this, um, this is something uh, known as ENZ analysis. And it's used in um, genomic analysis to kind of see what, um, what is kind of proceeding and what is following a particular thing. And so you can imagine this being very useful for genomics, like you wanna see what type of uh, genetic um, features uh, or epigenetic features might be uh, upstream of highly expressed genes per se. Um, so if we think about the same thing with a particular behavior we're interested in, so say our research question relates to how instructors are utilizing clicker questions in the classroom. So in that case, we can line up all of our clicker questions in our data set and see what other types of behaviors are happening in the um, couple of minutes preceding clicker questions and what's overlapping in the middle and what's kind of following. And so if we're really interested in how instructors are setting up their clicker questions, are they having people just answer individually or are they having people talk in groups with each other uh, before they answer? Or are they having both of those in sequence in a very traditional peer instruction type mode uh, where you click in with an answer uh, and then you actually talk to your neighbor after the fact and see, compare notes, see, try to convince your neighbor uh, that your reasoning is correct and learn from each other. So if you wanna actually like analyze if, if that's actually happening within your uh, data set, you might look at, in this case, we have in red here, uh, uh, the Copus code uh, IND, uh, independent thinking. And so we see as our clicker question starts, we have a spike in that. Um, so about in, in the uh, test data set we have in the paper here, about 30% of the time, um, uh, clicker question corresponds to people thinking independently and answering independently. But if we look at the um, uh, Lavender uh, CG code, this uh, clicker group uh, discussion code, we see that that very quickly spikes to over three quarters of the time by the time we're well within the clicker question. So this is something where um, we can look at both those two things and their trends, and we can compare the fact that independent thinking peaks earlier than the clicker group question discussion uh, code um, to kind of see that it seems like there is some level of independent thinking first and um, more of a switch to greater levels of group discussion as clicker questions go longer. Um, and so, you know, this is a big, you know, just a, a sample of how you might think about ordering mattering and analyzing it within this framework. Um, but it kind of gives you a flavor of um, why knowing that something happens before something else or after um, could contribute to you being able to study what you're looking at. Um, and, you know, the same thing kind of goes for, uh, just to give a second example in figure three, um, we're looking at an aggregate group of uh, instructors here. And then in part B and C, we looked at two individual classrooms and we see that the, the patterning is very different. Um, 
this red code here is silence, uh, wait time. And so we see an instructor that after asking a question, um, very, very frequently has a, a period of wait time. And we see an instructor that less than 5% of the time after answering a question, is there any wait time? People are immediately jumping in. That's gotta be a very different feeling in that classroom. So if you're asking questions about like question asking and verbal discourse in a classroom, uh, being able to get to the fine grained of like, what happens when someone actually asks that question? What are students doing in response? Um, it's really great to be able to have that fine grained like at a glance exactly how things are being followed. Okay. Um, so I see a couple questions um, about, again, just your, I think, getting our minds around your, your methodology. And so um, I'll, uh, I'll um, summarize from my interpretation of it, and then you can correct that and then, and then go on. Um, yeah. Elaborate a little bit more. But um, so I interpret it as your, um, your, CAG approach, classroom as genome approach, is, is an approach to dealing with a lot of information that you collect when you, when you, someone engages in using observational protocols to understand classrooms. So it's, a, it's an approach. Yep. And then, um, you've identified some different genomic software tools that um, were developed for asking questions about genomes, but you can apply them to asking questions about classrooms. Yeah. And, I think in your paper, you maybe had some examples of some software that might might be good options. Um, so I was curious if A, is that correct? Did I, did I get that correct on, on what is being promoted here? And then um, do you have some suggestions for folks like me who are an ecologist and not familiar with genome methods? Like how easy is it for us, would it be for us to use these um, genomic software tools? And um, what could be some potential hiccups or, or things that you need to be aware of when you're trying to use these tools that were developed for a different kind of methodology to apply them to classroom observation data? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, to, to take the first half, um, uh, your, your summary of uh, kind of how that, uh, how we were thinking about it in the paper is, is spot on. Yeah, okay. the, uh, we're, um, you know, thinking about this as kind of a, not necessarily an exact prescriptive approach, uh, but a, a general philosophy of how we might think about analyzing this type of data. Um, and then, then we can kind of get into the, into the nitty gritty of like how, uh, how one actually does it. Um, and that's kind of the second part of your question, which is like, um, if you're, if you buy into the fact that you can actually uh, make this analogy between uh, genomes and the classroom, how do you actually go about uh, taking advantage of that? And so we tried to give uh, at least uh, an idea of what that looks like. And one, you know, one bit of full disclosure is, you know, like we, we use tools that made sense for the questions we had. Um, but it doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. Um, so we talked about, for instance, using uh, bed tools uh, and translating um, the classroom observation data into these bed files, these genome um, type files that are widely used in the genomics community. Um, and that, um, that is something where, um, Translating the, the files um, into a genomic form can be, admittedly, sometimes it's a, you know, it's a little work. Uh, cleaning data always is. Um, but um, when you get to that point where you've, you've translated it and you have it in that, that format and you want to actually apply like some type of analysis uh, to it, um, it, it's, I'd say that, you know, it, getting started is the hardest part. Um, once you've kind of gotten, gotten going, um, things flow really easily. Um, but how do you take that first step? Um, so we're, um, we're hoping to try to ease that a bit by kind of um, 
producing some uh, workflows that are a little bit more um, accessible and plug and play if you haven't been working with bed tools in your day-to-day -day, uh, work uh, before. Um, that has slowed down a bit as we've both been moving. <laughs> uh, it kind of always throws a wrench in the works, but uh, um, I think that um, there is, um, you know, we, we've tried to give at least uh, a little bit in the supplemental about um, what that looks like from an actual code perspective. Um, so that can be a good resource. Um, but I would also say, you know, like, if you have a research question that you think is amenable to this and you're stuck at square one and you're like, I don't know how to start, but I think this is the way to go, um, please don't hesitate to reach out because I think that um, we'd be really happy uh, to engage with how that might look and to um, help people get started on, on what, what tools you may want to use for your particular situation. And if it's things that we've used before, um, kind of get you started on how we would implement it and uh, what that looks like and uh, help get the process rolling. So um, it's hard to answer specifically because it'll look different for everybody, uh, everybody out there, what, what they might want to actually address, but uh, there is help uh, and uh, we, we would love to provide it. So never, never hesitate to reach out. And um, would you say then that your approach is equally applicable across institution types? So all you need is a, a classroom and, you know, collect those data and then you could use it um, to, to ask questions you have about, like if you're at a community college or, or something like that. Yeah, I personally, I think that that's true. Um, I think that, um, you know, like, the, the only like uh, asterisk that I'd put is, you know, it might be a little harder to think about how to implement this for like an online classroom setting, you know, like, but if you're talking bricks and mortar, um, small classes, big classes, um, different institution types, it should be, it should be really helpful, regardless of the context um, that you're working within. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and did you, um, in your, um, before you arrived, I guess, at the genome as a, a good kind of approach, um, did you look at other different kind of biology methodologies that you thought might answer similar questions? Or is it because of your background in genomics, this one just really popped out and made sense to you? Uh, it, it really is kind of the, the background uh, part. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the, um, you know, the old saying, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail type deal. Uh, it, uh, it just ended up being very serendipitous that the, the type of um, problems that we were facing with the education data were problems that I had run into in just a very different context. Um, like if you're, if you're dealing with you know super granular, super uh, high volume data, you you really have to think computationally in order to make sense of it. Um, and and the more the more we were digging with the education data, the more parallels we were seeing. It, it's just a it's a high high dimension problem uh, where um, people had already figured out how to do these things. They just hadn't realized it also applied in different settings too. Yeah. So. Great. Um, so a question I had with another question here is, um, so a lot of the work that I do is qualitative based. And so um, we talked a few times about um, kind of identifying different teacher and student behaviors with the classroom observation protocols. And so I was curious um, kind of what, when you say behavior, a little bit what you what you mean by that, like what features are you tapping into? Like, um, yeah, a, a little bit more. What is your your kind of definition of behavior? And then, do you see a way that you can make connections between, you know, the kinds of conclusions you can draw about the large scale patterns about kind of the choreography of a class, and then digging into the 
maybe some qualitative aspects um, and layering that with your analytical approach? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think that um, one, of the, um, one of the ways to kind of think about it uh, that I find kind of compelling is just thinking about um, how it, um, it, there are some parallels to using classroom observation protocols to a qualitative uh, analysis of a classroom. Um, it, it, it is different, but there's a lot of similarities in that, like, if, if you think about how you might end up coding an interview transcript mm -hmm. and looking for repeated types of, uh, you know, either, um, uh, if you're looking at like how people are, um, are feeling, uh, how people are, um, expressing, uh, it obviously depends on what kind of interview it is, but if, if you are actually looking for the patterns of what's happening within what someone is saying, um, we're kind of doing a very similar thing with the classroom observation protocol of basically saying like, we have a little bit more rigidly defined, like this behavior is what we're interested in. This is what we're looking for. Um, and so one of the things that we can think about is A, we have that parallel, but B, if you have a particular behavior, say we code for um, you know, a, a student question. And so a student raises their hand, asks a question in class, and we mark that in our classroom observation protocol. So there is, um, there's nothing preventing us from then appending more information about that, class, uh, that question um, to our record that that question happened. So if, um, if you're looking at that question as a qualitative researcher and are trying to get a sense of like, is this question student looking for clarification? Is this student like just completely lost and doesn't know where to begin? Um, like, um, if we have, if we have additional information that we're, um, analyzing those particular elements for, we can always layer that on top. I think one of the things I, I tried to mention at the onset, uh, in the intro was that, uh, layering was one of the, the most important, uh, features that this philosophy allows is that we can really think about what overlaps. Um, so it's already baked in to think about like associating things at the same time period. So we can append extra information about the question and uh, add that in. And I'll note, we can also think about the reverse, um, which is really interesting. If you're a qualitative researcher and you are really interested in particular behaviors in the classroom, imagine a roadmap that basically has like timestamps of all of these different types of behaviors that you might be interested in. And now you just have basically can really focus in on, I'm interested in this type of behavior. I've got a classroom observation protocol that already flags like three related behaviors. I know where to look. So, you know, there's a, just to kind of flip the question on its head, um, right. it can be useful in a kind of a couple of different routes. Okay. Yeah, I know it can be a lot to dig through a whole interview transcript or, you know, that kind of a thing. So having a roadmap does sound like that could be, could be useful. Um, so we've got um, just a few more minutes left. And so um, maybe thinking of some of the bigger implications of this study. So um, I, uh, I really find those, um, the, the graphics that show of the kind of color genome is really, um, those really stick out in my mind and, and to looking at patterns that way. So um, would you see, like if an instructor or a researcher was asking questions about um, how teaching was occurring, you could compare multiple of those pictures then? Is that an appropriate way to conceptualize it when you wanted to start like maybe stepping back and getting a, a broader picture of like, well, this is how this instructor 
kind of engages in teaching overall or um, how, how do you, and then, and then what does that mean for that instructor? Like, um, I don't know, kind of some, that person wants to change or just evaluate the way they, they teach, how would they, they use that? Great question. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that you're referring to something like this. Is that yeah. what you were getting at? Um, it seems and, like a little summative. Yeah. Um, and so like in, in this figure, we had like five different observations kind of uh, all arrayed next to each other. Um, and this is a situation where these five were actually selected because they actually shared some characteristics. Um, so there's a lot that ends up being similar between them uh, in terms of patterning. But it also is um, by our own admission, information overload. Like there is a lot of information in here. Um, and it looks like something that might very well be in a genetics paper, you know, like it's uh, um, so it um, at this level of display, I would by my own admission say it would be pretty tricky to like have really um, easy comparisons or takeaways. Um, this is the type of thing where we would probably want to decrease the number of behaviors that we were really uh, displaying at the same time and really kind of focus in on the things that you were particularly interested in. Um, so um, if you're thinking about like, um, thinking, thinking about evaluating uh, improving your own teaching um, and using observation protocols and then say uh, classroom is genome as a mechanism to do that. Um, I think first off um, is the disclaimer that um, you don't always need say a dump truck to take a pound of dirt somewhere. Um, if you just have one class and you're only analyzing a couple of behaviors, mm -hmm. you may not need you may not need all of this. Um, where, where it really starts to shine is if you start to say, I have like half a dozen of my classroom videos that I have analyzed. And now I can start to look at the patterns across all six, um, regardless of which individual class period I'm looking at and see if things are different across that period or time, uh, or if all six are very consistent. Um, and to start to look at overarching behaviors when you have more and more information to throw into the mix. Or if you have one classroom observation, a video of yourself teaching, but you actually want to apply like three different methods of analysis to it, then again, this is fantastic because now we can start to think about like all of the different behaviors that you're coding at the same time and interweave the analyses very seamlessly without, um, without having, uh, you, you've got the ability to do that in a way that these tools were already designed to do. You know, we were already uh, looking at methylation versus chromatin versus uh, expression, you know, so doing the same thing in our education data, it's very seamless. So um, I'd say, um, the, the biggest things to think about are just exactly what is the question you want to answer um, and making sure that you're picking the right observation protocols to actually give you the information you need um, and taking advantage of the ability to look at it from more than one angle. Um, you know, we had a couple of figures in the paper about using more than one observation protocol at the same time, and they're often very complementary. You know, they, they can cover different time spans, they can cover different behaviors, and if you add them together, they're often more than the sum of their parts. So that can be a really powerful way to dig really deep if, you, if you're really interested about your own instruction. Um, it's, it can be really worth the time to, you know, look at it from three different angles and then be able to combine all three 
perspectives on it in the same analysis. So um, just to make sure I'm interpreting this figure correctly, uh, let's say I were to look at, I think um, in the center circle from yep. that's the focus. Yep. So like, is it lecture is the purple about five down? Is, is uh, that what the code is? So th those are all just the individual codes. And then where it's dark purple, that's where that behavior is occurring. And then where it's light purple, that's where there's a break. Am I interpreting that correctly? That is exactly right. Yeah. So, so we have, um, these are, these are classes, um, uh, LEC down here is lecture. We can see that in that case, almost all of the time in these classes is spent, uh, uh, with a lecture component. And then the L at the top is students listening, and that mirrors it. Yeah. Um, and then we see a variety of other codes that are interspersed throughout, uh, like uh, uh, a student question. Uh, we see it right here. And then two more examples later in that class. Um, and so in this case, uh, we overlapped it with uh, the Flanders interaction analysis, this verbal discourse um, coding scheme observation protocol. and we can see that the blocks look very different because Flanders only looks at three second chunks. So every three seconds we're coding whether or not something is happening. And so it looks a lot more granular than the COPUS, which is in two minute time blocks. Mm -hmm. But we can use them seamlessly together even though they're very different in this uh, approach. So then you um, see if I would interpret this correctly. So the lecture piece looks pretty solid in the COPUS, but it's a lot more um, differentiated in the Flanders? Is that in right? Flanders, this uh, number five code would be the most analogous uh, code okay. to lecturing. And okay. you can see that it's pretty, pretty solid still, but there's little, little chunks where it's not. You can see where the gaps in the lecturing are happening. Um, and often they're less than two minutes in length. So that's why we have such a like unbroken set of COPUS codes. But yeah we still have some spots where that person isn't lecturing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so I guess if someone were interested in kind of looking at their instruction over several class periods, they could have pictures like this and maybe there were specific codes they wanted to really dig into and they could look and see how those patterns change on those different class periods and then start getting a sense of um, kind of what their classroom looks like. Exactly, exactly. Um, and um, so do you think that it's possible to do these kinds of analyses in other uh, statistical software or um, it's just the kinds of things that you can do in the genomic software is just the, the commands you can do like the end analysis you had talked about, like um, it's just already set up to answer some questions that seem like they could be really relevant to a biology education researcher. I think, I think the latter. Um, I don't think that it's impossible to do um, some of these things uh, through other uh, mechanisms, but uh, a lot of the tools make it uh, very straightforward um, in a way that you'd have to work a lot harder through other means to get to the same end. Um, so, um, but I think that one of the things that we were hoping for in writing this is that people would also be kind of inspired to think about how they could use other tools um, that are in this same ballpark on their own data. Uh, and, and so um, it's, uh, it's kind of a yes and type scenario where um, uh, we've identified some tools that we think are really great and very helpful, um, but we think we're just scratching the surface. And I think that there's a lot of other routes, um, I mean, that, you might be able to take. I mean, like um, yourself as an ecologist might have a completely different lens with which to think about uh, this type of information. And it would be, it'd be amazing to be able to bring some of those tools to bear uh, on similar questions. Or, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of untapped potential there. Right, right. Um, great. Well, we are nearing kind of right at the end of the seminar session and so um, if uh, what we'd really like folks in the audience to do now is make use of the chat feature so not the question and answer but the chat feature and if you could just type in 
something that you learned today from the seminar that would be super helpful for us to know what people are pulling from these. So I'll just give you a minute to answer or to submit your text. So it's really helpful when you, you let us know the kinds of things that you are um, getting from these seminars. So thank you very much for, for providing us with your feedback. Great, thank you. Thank you for folks who've, who've submitted things. And then uh, the last thing for you to think about is um, if you could also, using that chat function, if you could give us some suggestions of other authors or topics that you would like to see featured in a webinar, uh, that would also be really helpful. Um, so go ahead and enter those in now, too. So it looks like people are really excited by the tools that you've presented and um, hopefully it'll like stimulate <laughs> research like you said in your in your paper and such that you're hoping that this would be um, help people answer some some questions that they maybe haven't been able to answer efficiently or, or very well um, up till now but now can have a tool set to try and synthesize all of these like you said these data that they're collecting yeah so um, this is the last uh, webinar of the year, so keep your eye out for when things start up again in the spring and um, the specific dates and who those guests are going to be. Um, so feel free to keep entering in your chats, um, either for your suggestions or the things you learned today while we finish up the last couple minutes. Thanks for sharing your work, Rob. Oh yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in. Uh, you know, it's uh, excited to share and hope that uh, it was useful to you. <laughs> yeah. Was, Got a few seconds left for anyone, your last, last chats, comments in. Um, have a good holiday season. Well, thank you both for participating and everyone have a great holiday. You as well.